Book Three, Canto Twelve, The Legend of Britomartis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, Book Three, The Legend of Britomartis, Canto Twelve. The mask of Cupid and the enchanted chamber are displayed, whence Britomart redeems fair amoret, through charms decayed. Though when as cheerless night ye cover it had, fair heaven with an universal cloud, that every white, dismayed with darkness sad, in silence and in sleep themselves did shroud, she heard a shrilling trumpet sound aloud, sign of nigh battle or got victory not therewith daunted was her courage proud but rather stirred to cruel enmity expecting ever when some foe she might descry with that an hideous storm of wind arose with dreadful thunder and lightning atwixt and an earthquake as if it straight would lose the world's foundations from his centre fixed a direful stench of smoke and sulphur mixed ensued, whose noyance filled the fearful stead from the fourth hour of night until the sixth. Yet the bold Britoness was not idred, though much in moved, but steadfast still persevered. All suddenly a stormy whirlwind blew throughout the house that clapped every door with which that iron wicket open flew as it with mighty levers had been tore, and forth issued, as on the ready floor of some theatre, a grave personage, that in his hand a branch of laurel bore, with comely haviour and countenance sage, he clad in costly garments fit for tragic stage. Proceeding to the midst, he still did stand, as if in mind he somewhat had to say, and to the vulgar beckoning with his hand, in sign of silence, as to hear a play, by lively actions he gan bewray some argument of matter passionate, which done he back retired soft away, and passing by his name discovered, ease, on his robe in golden letters ciphered, the noble maid still standing all this viewed and marvelled at his strange intendiment with that a joyous fellowship issued of minstrels making goodly merriment with wanton bards and rhymers impudent all which together sung full cheerfully a lay of love's delight with sweet consent after whom marched a jolly company in manner of a mask in range and orderly the whiles a most delicious harmony in full strange notes was sweetly heard to sound that the rare sweetness of the melody the feeble senses wholly did confound and that the frail soul in deep delight nigh drowned and when it ceased shrill trumpets loud did bray that their report did far away rebound and when they ceased it gan again to play the whiles the maskers marched forth in trim array. The first was fancy, like a lovely boy of rare aspect and beauty without peer, matchable either to that imp of Troy, whom Jove did love, and chose his cup to bear, or that same dainty lad which was so dear to great Alcides, that when as he died he wailed womanlike with many a tear, and every wood, and every valley wide he filled with Hylas name, the nymphs aeg Hylas cried. His garment neither was of silk nor say, but painted plumes in goodly order dight, like as the sunburnt Indians do array their tawny bodies in their proudest plight. As those same plumes so seemed he vain and light, that by his gait might easily appear for still he fared as dancing in delight, and in his hand a windy fan did bear, that in the idle air he moved still here and there, and him beside marched amorous desire, 
who seemed of riper years than the other swain, yet was that other swain this elder's sire, and gave him being commune to them twain. His garment was disguised very vain, and his embroidered bonnet set awry. Twixt both his hands few sparks he close did strain, which still he blew, and kindled busily, that soon they life conceived, and forth in flames did fly. Next after him went Doubt, who was he clad in a discoloured coat of strange disguise, that at his back a broad capuccio had, and sleeves dependent Albanese wise. He looked askew with his mistrustful eyes, and nicely trode as thorns lay in his way, or that the floor to shrink he did avise, and on a broken reed he still did stay his feeble steps, which shrunk when hard thereon he lay. With him went Donger, clothed in ragged weed, made of bear's skin that him more dreadful made, yet his own face was dreadful, nay did need strange horror to deform his greasy shade. A net in the one hand, and a rusty blade in the other was, this mischief, that mishap. With the one his foes he threatened to invade, with the other he his friends meant to enwrap. For whom he could not kill he practised to entrap. Next to him was fear, all armed from top to toe, yet thought himself not safe enough thereby, but feared each shadow moving to and fro, and his own arms when glittering he did spy or clashing herd he fast away did fly, as ashes, pale of hue, and winged heeled, and evermore on Donger fixed his eye, gainst whom he always bent a brazen shield, which his right hand, unarmed, fearfully did wield. With him went hope in rank, a handsome maid, of cheerful look, and lovely to behold. In silken samite she was light arrayed, and her fair locks were woven up in gold. She always smiled, and in her hand did hold an holy water sprinkle, dipped in dew, with which she sprinkled favors manifold, on whom she list, and did great liking show, great liking unto many, but true love to few. And after them dissemblance and suspect marched in one rank, yet an unequal pair, for she was gentle and of mild aspect, courteous to all, and seeming debonair, goodly adorned and exceeding fair. Yet was that all but painted and purloined, and her bright brows were decked with borrowed hair. Her deeds were forged, and her words false coined, and always in her hand two clues of silk she twined. But he was foul, ill-favoured and grim, under his eyebrows looking still askance, and ever as dissemblance laughed on him, he lowered on her with dangerous eye-glance, shewing his nature in his countenance. His rolling eyes did never rest in place, but walked each where, for fear of hid mischance, holding a lattice still before his face, through which he still did peep, as forward he did pace. Next him went grief, and fury matched the fear, grief all in sable, sorrowfully clad, down hanging his dull head with heavy cheer, yet inly being more than seeming sad. A pair of pincers in his hand he had, with which he pinched people to the heart, that from thenceforth a wretched life they lad, in wilful languor and consuming smart, dying each day with inward wounds of dolorous dart. But fury was full ill apparelled, in rags that the naked nigh she did appear, with ghastly looks and dreadful drearyhead, for from her back her garments she did tear, and from her head oft rent her snarled hair. In her right hand a firebrand she did toss about her head, still roaming here and there, as a dismayed deer, in chase embossed, forgetful of his safety, hath his right way lost. After them went displeasure and pleasance, 
he looking lumpish and full sullen sad, and hanging down his heavy countenance, she cheerful, fresh, and full of joyance glad, as if no sorrow she ne felt ne dread, that evil matched pair they seemed to be. An angry wasp the one in a vial had, the other in hers a honey lady bee. Thus marched these six couples forth in fair degree. After all these there marched a most fair dame, led of two gricey villains, the one despite, the other cleeped cruelty by name. She, doleful lady, like a dreary sprite, called by strong charms out of eternal night, had death's own image figured in her face, full of sad signs, fearful to living sight, yet in that horror shewed a seemly grace, and with her feeble feet did move a comely pace. Her breast all naked as net ivory, without adorn of gold or silver bright, wherewith the craftsman wants it beautify, of her due honour was despoiled quite, and a wide wound therein, O oh, rueful sight, entrenched deep with knife accursed keen, yet freshly bleeding forth her fainting sprite, the work of cruel hand was to be seen, that it dyed in sanguine red her skin all snowy clean. At that wide orifice her trembling heart was drawn forth, and in silver basin laid, quite through transfixed with a deadly dart, and in her blood yet steaming fresh embayed, and those two villains which her steps upstayed, when her weak feet could scarcely her sustain, and fading vital powers gan to fade, her far words still with torture did constrain, and evermore increased her consuming pain. Next, after her, the winged god himself came riding on a lion ravenous, taught to obey the menage of that elf, that man and beast with power imperious, subdueth to his kingdom tyrannous his blind fold eyes he bade a while unbind that his proud spoil of that same dolorous fair dame he might behold in perfect kind which seen he much rejoiced in his cruel mind of which full proud himself uprearing high he looked round about with stern disdain and did survey his goodly company and marshalling the evil ordered train, with that the darts which his right hand did strain, full dreadfully he shook, that all did quake, and clapped on high his coloured wings twain, that all his many it afraid did make, though blinding him again his way he forth did take. Behind him was reproach, repentance, shame, reproach the first, shame next, Repent behind, repentance feeble, sorrowful, and lame, reproach despiteful, careless, and unkind, shame most ill-favoured, bestial, and blind, shame lowered, repentance sighed, reproach did scold, reproach sharp stings, repentance whips entwined, shame burning bronze irons in her hand did hold, all three to each unlike, yet all made in one mould. And after them a rude, confused rout of persons flocked, whose names is hard to read. Amongst them was stern strife and anger stout, unquiet care and fond, unthrifty head, lewd loss of time and sorrow seeming dead, inconstant change and false disloyalty, consuming riotise, and guilty dread of heavenly vengeance, faint infirmity, vile poverty, and lastly death with infamy. There were full many mo like maladies, whose names and natures I note reading well, so many mo as there be fantasies in wavering women's wit that none can tell, or pains in love, or punishments in hell all which disguised marched in masking wise about the chamber with that damoiselle. 
and then returned, having marched thrice, into the inner room from whence they first did rise. So soon as they were in, the door straightway fast locked, driven with that stormy blast which first it opened, and bore all away. Then the brave maid, which all this while was plast in secret shade, and saw both first and last, issued forth, and went unto the door, to enter in, but found it locked fast. It vain she thought with rigorous uproar, for to a force, when charms, had closed it afore. Where force might not avail, their slights and art she cast to use, both fit for hard emprise, for thy from that same room not to depart till morrow next she did herself advise when that same mask again should forth arise the morrow next appeared with joyous cheer calling men to their daily exercise then she as morrow fresh herself did rear out of her secret stand that day for to outwear all that day she outwore in wandering, and gazing on that chamber's ornament, till that again the second evening her covered with her sable vestment, wherewith the world's fair beauty she hath blent. Then when the second watch was almost past, that brazen door flew open, and in went bold Britomart, as she had late forecast, neither of idle shoes nor of false charms aghast, so soon as she was entered, round about she cast her eyes to see what was become of all those persons which she saw without. But lo, they straight were vanished, all and some. Nay, living white she saw in all that room, save that same woeful lady, both whose hands were bound and fast, that did her ill become and her small waist girt round with iron bands, unto a brazen pillar by the which she stands. And her before the vile enchanter sate, figuring strange characters of his art, with living blood he those characters rate, dreadfully dropping from her dying heart, seeming transfixed with a cruel dart, and all perforce to make her him to love. Ah, who can love the worker of her smart? A thousand charms he formerly did prove, Yet a thousand charms could not her steadfast heart remove. Soon as that virgin knight he saw in place, His wicked books in haste he overthrew, Not caring his long labours to deface, And fiercely running to that lady true. A murderous knife out of his pocket drew, The which he thought for villainous despite, in her tormented body to imbrue. But the stout damsel, to him leaping light, his cursed hand withheld and mastered his might. From her, to whom his fury first he meant, the wicked weapon rashly he digressed, and turning to herself his fell intent, unwares it struck into her snowy chest, that little drops empurpled her fair breast. Exceeding wroth therewith the virgin grew, albe the wound was nothing deep impressed, and fiercely forth her mortal blade she drew, to give him the reward for such vile outrage due. So mightily she smote him, that to ground he fell half dead, next stroke him should have slain, had not the lady, which by him stood bound, dernly unto her called to abstain from doing him to die. For else her pain should be remediless, sith none but he which wrought it could the same recure again. Therewith she stayed her hand, loath stayed to be, for life she him envied, and long revenge to see. And to him said, Thou wicked man whose meed for so huge mischief, and vile villainy is death, or if that ought do death exceed, be sure that naught may save thee from to die. Be sure that naught may save thee from to die. But if that thou this dame do presently restore unto her health and former state, this do and live, else die undoubtedly, 
He, glad of life that looked for death but late, Did yield himself right willing to prolong his date. And rising up, gan straight to overlook those cursed leaves, His charms back to reverse, full dreadful things, Out of that baleful book he read, and measured many a sad verse, That horror gan the virgin's heart to purse, And her fair locks upstared stiff on end. Hearing him those same bloody lines rehearse, And all the while he read, She did extend her sword high over him, If aught he did offend. Anon she gan perceive the house to quake, And all the doors to rattle round about, Yet all that did not her dismayed make, Nor slack her threatful hand for danger's doubt, But still with steadfast eye and courage stout abode, to weet what end would come of all. At last that mighty chain, which round about her tender waist was wound, adown gan fall, and that great brazen pillar broke in pieces small. The cruel steel, which thrilled her dying heart, fell softly forth, as of his own accord, and the wide wound, which lately did dispart her bleeding breast, and riven bowels gored was closed up as it had not been bored and every part to safety full sound as she was never hurt was soon restored though when she felt herself to be unbound and perfect whole prostrate she fell unto the ground before fair britomart she fell prostrate saying ah noble knight what worthy meed can wretched lady quit from woeful state, yield you in lieu of this your gracious deed. Your virtue self her own reward shall breed, even immortal praise and glory wide, which I, your vassal, by your prowess freed, shall through the world make to be notified, and goodly well advance that goodly well was tried. But Britomart, uprearing her from ground, said, Gentle dame, reward enough, I ween, for many labours more than I have found, this that in safety now I have you seen, and mean of your deliverance have been. Henceforth, fair lady, comfort to you take, and put away remembrance of late teen. Instead thereof I know that your loving make hath no less grief endured for your gentle sake. She much was cheered to hear him mentioned, Whom of all living whites she loved best, Then laid the noble championess strong hand Upon the enchanter, who had her distressed so sore, And with foul outrages oppressed, With that great chain, wherewith not long ago He bound that piteous lady prisoner, Now released, himself she bound, More worthy to be so, and captive, with her led to wretchedness and woe, returning back those goodly rooms which erst she saw so rich and royally arrayed, now vanished utterly and clean, subversed she found, and all their glory quite decayed. That sight of such a change her much dismayed, thenceforth descending to that perilous porch, those dreadful flames she also found delayed and quenched quite like a consumed torch, that erst all enterers want so cruelly to scorch. More easy issue now than entrance late she found, for now that feigned dreadful flame, which choked the porch of that enchanted gate, and passage barred to all, that thither came, was vanished quite, as it were not the same, and gave her leave at pleasure forth to pass, the enchant herself, which all that fraud did frame, to have enforced the love of that fair lass, seeing his work now wasted deep in grief it was. But when the victoress arrived there, where late she left the pensive Scudamore with her own trusty squire, both full of fear, neither of them she found where she them lore, thereat her noble heart was astonished sore, but most fair amoret whose gentle sprite now gan to feed on hope, which she before conceived had, to see her own dear knight, being thereof beguiled, was filled with new affright. 
But he, sad man, when he had long in dread awaited there for Britomart's return, yet saw her not, nor sign of her good speed, his expectation to despair did turn, misdeeming sure that her those flames did burn, and therefore gan advise with her old squire, who her dear nursling's loss no less did mourn, thence to depart for further aid to inquire, where let them wind it will, whilst here I do respire. Note, stanzas in 1590 replaced in 1596 with others. At last she came unto the place where late she left Sir Scudamore in great distress, twixt dolor and despite half desperate, of his love's succor, of his own redress, and of the hardy Britomart's success. There on the cold earth him now thrown she found in wilful anguish, and dead heaviness, and to him called, whose voice is known sound soon as he heard, himself he reared light from ground. There did he see that most on earth him joyed, his dearest love, the comfort of his days, whose too long absence him had sore annoyed, and wearied his life with dull delays. Straight he upstarted from the loathed lays, and to her ran with hasty eagerness, like as a deer that greedily embays in cool soil after long thirstiness, which he in chase endured hath, now nigh breathless. Lightly he clipped her twixt his arms twain, and straightly did embrace her body bright, her body late the prison of sad pain, now the sweet lodge of love and dear delight, but she, fair lady, overcome in quite, of huge affection, did in pleasure melt, and in sweet ravishment poured out her sprite. No word they spake, nor earthly thing they felt, but like two senseless stocks in long embracement dwelt. Had ye them seen, ye would have surely thought that they had been that fair hermaphrodite, which that rich Roman of white marble wrought, and in his costly bath caused to be sight. So seemed those two, as grown together quite, that Britomart, half envying their bless, was much impassioned in her gentle sprite, and to herself oft wished like happiness. In vain she wished that fate nud let her yet possess. Thus do those lovers with sweet countervail each other of love's bitter fruit to despoil. But now my term begins to faint and fail, all waxen weary of their journal toil. Therefore I will their sweaty yokes assoil, at this same furrow's end till a new day. And ye fair swains, after your long turmoil, now cease your work, and at your pleasure play. Now cease your work, to-morrow is an holy day. End of Canto 12 End of Book 3 The Legend of Britomartis